All right, guys, here I am for the second session. I hope you enjoyed the session, but more than anything, I hope that you actually put some of these things into practice. You know, all these sessions are really going to do for you is, is give you some tools, or at least my sessions. I don't know how the other sessions are, are designed, but I'm giving you some tools and it's all about what you do with these tools when you leave here that's going to determine the benefit that you get out of, out of the sessions. And so today I'm going to be giving you some tools, some information, and some tools. And it's going to be about taking it out of here and putting it into application. You know, today we're talking about force versus inspiration. Now, an interesting thing about how we are created, we are wired in every way to live in paradise. You know, not only, you know, did man live in a, in a paradise at the beginning of creation, and if you don't believe that, that's all right, because we still have all kinds of other factors that indicate that we were wired to, to live in fulfillment or pleasure and avoid pain. Our very nervous system is such that if something is pleasurable, we are drawn toward it, we are open to it. But if there's the anticipation or the expectation of pain, we are going to absolutely run away from it. Now, interesting thing about pain and pleasure, pain and pleasure, just like so many other areas of life, are not based on what's really gonna bring us pain and pleasure. It's based on our perception about what's gonna bring us pain or pleasure or our beliefs about what's gonna bring us pain or pleasure. So in any situation, if you look at it, the more the possibility of pleasure and the more sure that possibility is, is real and true, the more you are drawn to and willing to put effort into what it takes to have that pleasure. Now, we will face pleasure, uh, uh, or excuse me, we'll face pain even when we know there's going to be pain, but if the pleasure is great enough, we, we don't mind facing a little pain to get to a lot of pleasure. But if the pleasure is not sure, then we're not willing to face pain. Or if the pain outweighs the pleasure, we're not going to pursue the pleasure. And so the problem is, through our beliefs, we actually come up with, with beliefs about what will bring us pain and pleasure. And, uh, and sometimes our perception becomes so twisted that the things that will actually bring us the greatest pleasure because there is pain in them, we, we, we won't pursue because the pain is sure, but we're really not sure about the pleasure. Now, in relationships, there's probably few places where that is as true as it is in relationships. Now, remember, your nervous system is wired this way. This is not something you logically weigh out and say, hey, let me, let me, let me get out my pedal pleasure calculator and figure out how much pleasure, and then let me punch in the pain. Oh, can't do that, you know. No, it's not like that. You don't even realize what's happening is happening at such a subconscious level that, that you just, you, you just, start subconsciously moving away from situations where the pain is sure, but the pleasure is not sure. Now see, in relationships, the pleasure revolves around several variables. The pleasure is going to be the track record of the person that you're wanting to have a relationship. The, it's going to be your, tr your experience with other people, other relationships. In other words, there's all kinds of things that you factor in that really may have nothing much to do with the situation you're in right now. You know, uh, <clears throat> years ago, and I might have mentioned this in the previous video, I don't remember, but yeah, I did actually. You know, I talked about the fact how back in 2005, I was in a really bad automobile accident. I was, you know, busted up. I was in physical pain constantly and um, I actually went blind completely blind twice because I had brainstem compression, uh, kept getting these mystery infections, no explanation for them. And it was all a result of this, this automobile accident that I was in. And of course, during this time, like I say, Brenda went into a monumental menopausal meltdown. Now, many people would ask me, they would say, why do you think you all made it through such a terrible time? Well, part of it was this. 
Brenda had a track record of really being such an incredible wife that I had positive expectation. We get past this and things even get close to being as good as they used to be. I'm living a better life than most people are ever going to have because she was a really, really good wife. Now, if she had not been a really good wife, if she hadn't really given me or, or provided for me a great track record, I would not have had the hope or the expectation of pleasure. There would not have been enough pleasure to make the emotional pain I was going through worth it had it not been for her track record. And, and you know, uh, here's something you have to understand about, about marriage, about relationships. Marriage is completely free enterprise. In other words, people don't stay into marriages because they're legally bound. People don't stay in marriages because if they leave, they'll lose their money and, and live, end up living in a hotel. People don't, you know, people don't stay in marriages out of any sense of obligation. People stay in marriages because they, they either have the hope of, of pleasure in the marriage or they fear the pain of separation. But, but here, here's the, my point. It's all free enterprise. You cannot hold anybody in a relationship out of obligation. It will eventually blow up for one, one cause or the other. And so because of the fact that this is free enterprise, we're not out of fear and insecurity trying to make sure our mate loves us. But the real truth is because it's free enterprise, uh, we do have to be responsible about, responsible about whether or not we are inspiring the other person to love us. Because remember, the word love in its basic, most basic understanding is value. Does my mate value me enough to put up with my crap? Or does my mate value me enough to stick with me when we go through hard financial times or when we go through emotional difficult times? And, and the value that my wife has for me it is not really based on her character. It's just based on my track record of how I treated her. Now, if she doesn't value me that much, she might, if she's got a good character, she might put up with me you know, longer than she should. But at some point, if I am not making myself valuable, then, then she's gone. And so you have to understand that that free enterprise factor is there, like it or not. And you can come up with all kinds of reasons. You know, as a pastor, you know, I pastored a church for over 30 years. You know, you'd have people come in and, and say to their, mount, their mate, it's like, well, you can't leave me. We're Christians. And I'd always say, well, you know something, you better back up on that because uh, I've seen hundreds of Christians get divorces and you're going to get a divorce if you think you're going to hold anybody in this marriage by obligation. So free enterprise. So you have to understand that. Now, you know, when you, when you get married, you're looking at this person and basically on that day, at that moment, they are the pearl of great price. You know, there's, the pearl of great price actually refers to the kingdom of God and, 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 and where, where, you know, a merchant finds a pearl in a field and he goes, sells everything he's got so that he can get this pearl. And it's, it's talking about that's how valuable knowing God is. Well, that applies to any arena of life where, where people are walking in love. So, you know, that day that you're getting married, you're saying, you are so valuable to me. I'm giving up all my other uh, uh, love connections. I'm giving, up, I'm giving up the right to ever be emotionally or sexually involved with anybody for the rest of my life. I am putting you first. And I tell you, that day and that moment and when those vows are said, you probably are seeing them as your pearl of great price. I'll, I'm giving up all the freedoms that I have pretty much uh, to invest in this relationship or bring them into this relationship. Now, <clears throat> the problem is this. One day uh, in this process, mm, you get up feeling bad or you just kind of get into a selfish, lazy kind of mode and so you either you use or in some way take your spouse for granted. And so you convey to them that day that they're not as valuable to you as they thought they were because you're willing to use them. You're willing to be selfish. You're willing to take advantage of, 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 of their kindness. And so a process starts happening uh, 
a syndrome, if you will, where it's like, okay, so you don't value me so much, so I'm, I'm not going to value you so much. And so each day, selfishness, self-centeredness comes in, and there's a thing that happens called hardness of heart. Now, hardness of heart, remember, your heart is, is the seat of, of where you have the capacity to love. It's the seat of fear. It's the seat, it's the seat of all your deep, deep rooted emotions. And, but as much as anything, it's also the seat of how you see yourself. Your self perception is housed in the thoughts and the memories uh, in your heart. So, so uh, at, at some point in time, if a person hardens their heart, now wh why would a person harden their heart? Well, because you see, if, if you're taking advantage of your spouse, the only way they can survive in a hostile env environment is to harden themselves. So if I harden myself to a person's insults, I also harden myself to the person's kindnesses. In other words, I'm, I'm not just harden I'm, I'm not just selectively hardening myself to protect myself against insults. I'm trying to protect myself against the person. Now, you know, it's really interesting. You know, the Bible is full of all kinds of, of people trying to be religious, theological, and, you know, legalistic controllers. And, and of course, Jesus never would buy into that. And they, they were asking him some tricky theological question about marriage and divorce. And he never would answer the question, but he said, I'll tell you what, here's the real reason people end up getting divorced is hardness of heart. And you know, it is. We harden our heart because we have to protect ourselves against the unkindness of others. And when we harden our heart, not only can we not feel emotionally and connect emotionally to them, uh, and we can't, like I said, we can't feel the insults, but we also can't feel whatever love they might be trying to give. So eventually, it, 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 that thing just dies on the vine. Now, in marriage and in a relationship, you are going to use inspiration or force to get what you want. That's, that's pretty much it because, you know, manipulation is a form of force. Uh, intimidation is a form of force. Uh, nagging, complaining, it's a form of force. Uh, uh, we have all of these ways that we use force to try to get a person to do what we want. And so we have to realize every time we use force instead of inspiration, we are implying to that person to that person that we don't have value for them. So, you know, we don't mind hurting them. We don't mind degrading them. We don't mind making them feel bad about themselves as long as we get what we want out of that situation. Now, one of the things you have to always remember is this. Whatever you use to get something that you want is what you have to do to keep it after you get it. So, in relationships, if we can't inspire love in another person, then we try to force, manipulate them into doing the things to make us feel loved or make us feel special. Uh, but the problem is if we use force, pressure, manipulation, intimidation to get those things, then we have to keep doing that in order to keep them doing what we want them to do. Now, one of the problems is when you manipulate or force a person to do something for you, whether it's be kind to you, cook for you, have sex with you, you know, whatever, whatever it is you want them to do, when, when, you have, when you use force or manipulation of any kind, no matter what they do for you, you might get pleasure out of it, but you know it's not an act of love. You know they're not doing it because of how much they value you and how precious you are to them. They are doing it just to get you off their back. They're doing it because this is the only way to escape the misery that you're piling on them. And so the problem is then you start needing more and more from them because you're not feeling loved, even though they're giving up their whole life, you know, for you. You don't feel love because in your heart, you know, it has nothing to do with the fact that they consider you valuable and precious and hold, hold you in high regard. So, what you get by force is never love, and it never it, it will give you pleasure, but it will never, ever, ever make you feel loved. Now, there's an interesting universal law, 
And again, wh whether you believe in creation or whether you believe in creation by design, whether you believe in creation by God, whether you, believe, whether you just believe creation happened, doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter if you're a Christian, a Buddhist, an atheist, a new, a new ager. There is one universal law that was programmed into creation, and it's the law of the seed. The law of the seed is sowing and reaping. Now, religious people take sowing and reaping and say, you do this and God punishes you this way. No, sowing and reaping has nothing to do with God doing anything. It has nothing to do with faith. It has nothing to do with anything except this. The law of the seed says this. You can only grow the type of fruit that you want if you plant the seed that produces that fruit. So in other words, you can't plant watermelon seed and grow peaches. You can't uh, you know, plant uh, apple seeds and, and grow spinach. You are always going to get back what kind of seed that you plant into a situation. And it, and it also means that if you don't sow a seed, there is nothing to receive. You can't, you can't receive back. And Jesus even talked about that, uh, and, and psychology talks about that, uh, where, where we project onto people our motives for doing things. So if, if I'm only kind to you when I'm manipulating you and trying to get something out of you, then even, when you're kind to me, even though you may be sincere and even though you may love me, I will project onto you my, my values, why I do those things. I'll say, oh, you're just trying to manipulate me. This isn't love. You don't, you don't really care that much about me. So you have to realize you cannot reap what you do not sow. You cannot receive what you will not give. And so the person who does not live life, and especially in, in any particular relationship, uh, express and be motivated by genuine love, that person cannot receive love. And the deepest need that all human beings have is the need to give and receive love because that's where our self-worth comes from because love is all about value. Am I valuable? And do, you know, do, does the most important person in my life treat me in a way that I, that I am valuable? So in, in our relationship, we, we want to realize this is free enterprise, and the quality of this relationship is going to be in exact proportion to the types of seeds that I plant in this relationship and the quality of, of, of those seeds. And so, so we want to avoid driving one another into hardness of heart. We, we don't want there to be any kind of abuse, mental or physical abuse. But there's another interesting thing in free enterprise that affects businesses, it affects marriages, it affects every free enterprise factor, and that is, that is appreciation. Now, <clears throat> I, like I told you the other day, I've been in business all of my life, so I'm always studying business, always trying to understand how to be effective at what I do. And so uh, uh, I'm always reading these studies, and studies revealed that People who have been loyal customers to any particular business and then a, for no apparent reason, they just kind of disappear. They just stop shopping at that store. They start shopping somewhere else. They, or, or they stop doing business with that particular individual. They, they, they do business somewhere else. The number one reason loyal customers stop doing business is because at some point they begin to feel they are not appreciated, that they are taken uh, that they're taken for granted. And so you have to realize one of the most important things that we have to do is we have to express our love to the people around us. And we need to be uh, recognizing and validating why they're valuable to us. The things that we are thankful for, the things that we appreciate, the things that make us feel valuable and precious. And uh, it's in this environment where there is mutual value and, of course, ultimately mutual trust where we have the opportunity to build this team that we were talking about in the last session where we both really and truly have each other's backs. Now, I want to talk a little bit about qualities of a good, of a good team member. Then I'm going to give you uh, an extra, a couple little exercises that you can do to, to really uh, uh, take your marriage team 
to a whole new level. But I just want to run through what I consider to be some of the, some of the greatest strengths of a good team member. And you've got to evaluate yourself. As a matter of fact, I would encourage you to write these statements down. Give yourself uh, a, a, a score of one to 10, one being the least, 10 being the greatest, of how you feel like you register on this scale. And then also give your mate, give your spouse a score of from one to 10. For example, first quality of, of, of a good team member is they listen. So do you really listen to your spouse? One on a scale of one to 10, one being, mm, no, you know, I just almost never pay attention. Uh, you know, two might be, I try to pretend like I'm paying attention. Three is like, well, if it interests me, I might pay attention. You know, a five is, uh, if, I, if, if, if I don't pay attention, I'm going to get screened at. You know, a seven might be, you know, I, I'm, I really am interested in what my spouse is saying. Uh, so so you, you score yourself and then you score your spouse. And when, and I'll tell you, when I get to the end of this, I'll tell you what I want you to do with that score. It's going to be an exercise that you're going to do. Now, a second thing is not only do they listen, but they give meaningful input. Now, remember, we talked yesterday or in the, in the last session about the fact that uh, a helper is somebody who brings their perception or their perspective to a situation and, um, and they're willing to say what, what, what needs to be said. Now, what's really interesting, some of the people that are the most insightful, based on their behavior pattern, they are people who really dislike conflict, and sometimes they are a little reticent to give their input because, because uh, they know you're going to argue with them, or they know you're not going to listen to them, or they know that you're not, you know, that you're not going to listen, that you're not going to be interested in, in their input. You're not going to think that they, that their insight means anything. So, <clears throat> so if you're one of those people who says, like, you know, I, no, I never really say what I think because he's not going to listen anyhow, and he's just going to accuse me of being negative. Well, if you don't give input. Now, if, if there's physical abuse there, uh, then yeah, then, then all the rules. As a matter of fact, if there's physical abuse, you don't need to be there. When there's physical abuse, you need to stay apart till all the problems are solved, everybody's gotten healthy, and then find out if you can get back together and, and work it out. But so many times, you'll have a dominating spouse that says, well, you know, he or she never tells me up front uh, you know, what they're seeing, but then after it's over and it don't work out, they're like, I knew it wasn't going to work. And then there's this big fight. Well, if you knew it wasn't going to work, why didn't you tell me? Well, let me tell you, one of the main reasons people do not give you input, if you're one of those people that never gets input, there's a reason for it, and that is because of the way you respond to people's input. If you respond to people's input like it means nothing, then you're saying, I have no value for your input. I don't love you. If you, if you respond to people's input by being degrading, then you're making them try to devalue themselves. If, if you get argumentative and you say, oh, see, you're never supporting my ideas, uh, then, then why should they give you input? If you're not going to listen, because remember, the first thing is listening. So if I want somebody to give me input, I've got to be a good listener, and I've got to be able to hear things that I might not want to hear without reacting. You know, uh, when Brenda and I got married, she had been in a very abusive relationship. Her, uh, her previous husband, who was dead uh, when we got married, he, um, he was very violent, very physical, beat her on a regular basis. So if he said, you know, uh, uh, I want, to talk, I want to talk about something. Really what that meant was, I'm, I'm, really gonna, I'm really gonna blame you for a lot of things and then I'm gonna beat you. Now, I'm the kind of guy, let's just solve problems. Let's just talk about it. Even if we get upset, let's get upset, whatever we gotta do. But at the end of it, the whole point of communication is to solve the problem, not to prove who's right. And uh, so, you know, for me, it's just like, hey, you know, we need, we need to talk about this. And I tell you, when we first got married, I'm telling you, she would just shut down. And I didn't know that when I said, let's talk, that in her life experience, that translated into, I'm going to scream at you uh, for about an hour, and then I'm going to beat you. 
Uh, but that, you know, and she might not have even been logically thinking that, but that's what she felt because that's what her life experience has been. Now, here's the, here's the way it kind of go. All of you, all of you know how this works. So, <clears throat> you know, look, uh, you know, we need talking. Tell something's bothering you. Nope, nope, nope. Nothing's bothering me. And uh, you know, you know something's bothering them. And um, uh, you know, you know, you get up in the morning and there's a box of rat poison sitting by the coffee pot, and you're afraid to drink it. You know something's bothering them. And so you're like, you get a, a week of, no, 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 nothing, nothing's wrong. Nothing's bothering me. And so, you know, you, you persist. It's like, look, you know, I know something's bothering me. Just please talk to me. Let's, let's work this out. Well, you know, the second week of the silent treatment is, uh, I don't want to talk about it. And you're like, oh, so there is something, but you don't want to talk about it. You don't want to solve this problem. You're not as mature as me, see, because I want to solve the problem. And you see, you don't want to solve the problem. We can solve this problem. We, this could all be over in a minute. We just talk about it. So you get about a week of I don't want to talk about it or longer. And you do realize that during all of this, there's also, this is also no sex time. You know, we are not, you know, I don't want to talk about it. Also means don't touch me. I'm not having sex with you. So, you know, that kind of makes your intensity for wanting to solve this problem uh, uh, get solved a lot quicker, particularly, you know, like when you're 30 years old and your, your sex drive is, is, is like, you know, your top of your head is like a volcano. So, you know, you get out, out to week three and it's like, look, let's, you know, please just talk to me about this. And of course, by this time, you really don't want to solve the problem. You just want to have sex, you know, anyhow. But anyhow, never mind all that. So anyhow, by week three, you know, you're like, look, please talk to me about this. Let, let's, let's work this through. And then it's like, um, it's like, well, if I talk, you're, you're not going to listen or you're not going to like it or, or, you know, and you're like, no, no. I, I'll listen. I'll like it. No, let's. So, you know, week three goes by silent treatment. No love, no affection, no talking. So, you know, week four comes, man, you're, 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 you're a mess, and you're just like, look, please talk to me. So week four is like, if I tell you, you'll get mad. I'm not going to get mad. I just want to solve the problem. So you make about another week of that. So finally, you know, a month has gone by, and Brenda's really finally ready to tell me what it is. And when she te <laughs> tells me what it is, it is something so insignificant that I cannot believe she has put, you know, she tells me, and I'm saying this to her, I'm saying, you're telling me, you gave me four weeks of the silent treatment just over this, just over the four weeks. You don't talk to me. We don't make love. We don't have anything to do with each other because of this. And she says, I told you, you'd get mad. Now, man, when we were, the first 10 years we were married, I can't even tell you how many times we went through that scenario. And so, I could do two things here. Well, actually, I could do three things in this situation. Uh, I could just stay mad and start hardening my heart toward her. I could, um, I could try to use force to force her to talk, which would really just drive her deeper. If a person doesn't want to talk and you use force, it drives them deeper into their problem. Matter of fact, anything you try to get from anybody from force pretty much drives the problem deeper into their heart, into their beliefs, into their fears, into their struggles. Or I find a way to inspire. And so I can, I can remember where I was. I was standing in our laundry room after we'd just gone through one of these month-long scenarios. I'm just thinking, I don't, I don't, I don't know what to do. I, I don't know what to do. And, you know, I really believe it was the Lord speaking in my heart it may have just been personal inspiration, but I, in my heart, I had this sense of no matter what she says to you, no matter how illogical, no matter how irrational, no matter how right or wrong I think it is, I am never going to respond negatively. I'm not even going to respond object, objectively because, because many times when I just be trying to give objectivity, she say, see, you're not listening to me. I was thinking, yeah, I'm listening, I'm just I'm trying to give you some solutions about how we're going to solve it because that's how I do it. And how I do it is obviously the right way, you know. And so <clears throat> it got to where if I, if I felt like she was presenting something to me that was kind of off base, it didn't matter if I disagreed, liked it, didn't like it, I would just say, you know what, I, I want to think about that for a little while. And I found that if I would give her a few days to get over the fear of me reacting, 
that I could come back and say, you know, I've thought about this. And instead of just giving my point of view, just asking her some questions. I said, what, so what about this? You think, you, think, you think we might run into this particular problem? And over time, I proved that she could disagree with me without a fight, that, that, that she could disagree with, with me without me trying to be objective and, and uh, uh, fix the situation. And e eventually she became inspired to be more open. So we have to, if we want people to speak into our lives, we don't need to make it so painful for them. Because remember, they avoid pain. Everybody avoids pain, seeks pleasure. You know, if you're about to do something that's going to cause your family to lose every penny you've got, and your spouse can see it, but they know if they tell you it's just going to be a big old fight, they're going to do it anyhow, and then they're going to blame you. You know, there, there's one man uh, who, who I've, I've known this guy, you know, since I was mm, maybe 21, 20, 22 years old, 23 years old, and he's the same age I am. And to this day, he has never listened to his wife on anything. And to this day, if she ever gives him any input, it makes him mad because she's really just, she really just is a better business person than he is. And to this day, he insists that the reason that almost everything he's ever tried has failed is because she won't get in agreement with him. If you, just get, if you would just support me. Well, let me tell you something. People don't need to support stupid. And so if you got some stupid idea that's not going to work, the last thing you need is your spouse getting in agreement with you because that defeats the whole concept of somebody coming in and seeing another perspective and, 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 and protecting you, uh, not by trying to make you do it their way, but giving you that input and that opportunity to reflect and, and decide, do I need to change my course here? Do I need to go in another direction? So, so characteristics of a great team member, they listen. Number two, they give input. Number three, they can be objective. Now, objectivity comes easier for some people than it does others. And of course, some people think they're objective and they're, they're really not. But objectivity is the ability to see something independent of how it's going to affect me. So there are a lot of things that I realize. There's a lot of decisions that Brenda and I make together. There's a lot of decisions I make in my business and my ministry that I know these decisions are going to create certain types of hardships for me. But the question is, uh, will facing those hardships get me to the pleasure, get me to the, the success, get me to the reward that I want on the other side? If you can't think, if you won't think objectively, then all you're going to think is subjectively. We'll talk about that in just a minute. So the question is, can you be objective? Can you, can, can you see the validity of another person's point of view? Can you set aside how, how things affect you or even how somebody disagreeing with you affects you? Can you set that aside for a minute, be willing to listen and consider that information? If you can't, then you will drop into that category where giving you input, being there for you, trying to help you is more pain than it is pleasure. So it's easier to let you fail and then gripe and complain and blame everybody for the next six months than it is to try to give you input and it turn into this big massive explosion. But here is another thing. Uh, <clears throat> can you be subjective when you need to be? Now, one of the things that I want to teach you how to do, and, and, if, and if you read my book, We Still Kiss, it is full of exercises that you can do about how to stay in love, how to create meaningful communication. And by the way, if you do get that book, and, 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 and uh, Nick and Allie have that book there, if you do get that book, the way that book is designed is every week you both read the same chapter, and then you have one night a week that is set aside. This is going to be the night we're going to sit around, drink coffee, go out to eat, and we're going to talk about that chapter that we've read, you know, you don't have to agree with it. You don't have to, you know, you just talk about it. How, what did this bring up? Uh, are, are we applying these principles? You know, do we need to consider some of these principles? Not that you're going to do everything, but I tell you, it's going to open up a dialogue that is going to change your whole world. So every week for every chapter of that book, you're going to have the date where you get together and you're going to discuss things that I promise you this, you've never discussed. Oh yeah, man, we have talked about everything. You know, when I did premarital counseling, people, uh, people would come in and, and uh, you know, if they wanted me to do, when I was a pastor, if they wanted me to do their wedding, they had to go through premarital counseling. 
And the premarital counseling was designed for one thing. It wasn't that great of counseling. It just got them to talk about things they had never talked about. And they would insist that they, man, that they were open, that they talked about everything. And so I'd give them a copy of my book, We Still Kiss. They would go through it. 50% of the people that went through my premarital counseling program ended up not marrying each other because they realized they hadn't ever discussed some of these things and they, they were never going to come to agreement on some of these things. You say, well, does that mean if we read it, we might get a divorce? Well, you might, I don't know. But it means that you will have the opportunity to discuss and work through things that you probably don't even realize are negatively affecting the relationship. So <clears throat> we want people to be objective and, and look at things, but, but here's, a, here's another thing. We have, to, we have to be able to say to another person, this is how your behavior is affecting me. This is how uh, what you just said to me makes me feel. And we can't discount those feelings because I, you know, I, don't, want, I don't want my love life with, with my wife to be based on a marriage contract you know, that we've got in a frame hanging on the wall somewhere around the house. I, I don't want her to just be there because this is the convenient thing to do. I want to wake up every day and me and her both be passionately in love. I want to wake up every day with both of us living for that mission where we said, you know, I'm going to get up every day and make you feel loved. You know, I never ask my wife to do menial things for me. Never. I don't ask, you know, but man, I appreciate it when she does. You know, my sister came and spent the night with us last night. And, you know, I got up this morning. And I deliberately didn't go to work early so I could sit around and visit with my sister. You know, my wife comes in and, and you know, she doesn't have to do these things. But, you know, she, she brings me a, you know, she makes me a cup of tea and brings it in there and comes in there in a few minutes and says, how about I fix you all some breakfast? Now, to some women, you might think that's demeaning. My wife isn't doing that because she feels like that's what she has to do. She's doing that because she is, she is trying to affect the way I feel. She wants me to feel deeply in love with her, just like I want her to feel deeply in love with me. So you don't have the right to have an offense at what someone does or what someone says if when they do it, you don't establish a boundary. And establishing a boundary doesn't mean you attack somebody. It means I'm going to talk to you subjectively. I want to make sure you understand how it makes me feel when you do X, Y, Z, or when you say X, Y, Z. Now, here's the thing. Once that person knows how it makes you feel, then you get to find out who they really are. And if they keep doing it, then it means they're not too interested in how you feel. And it's time to get some serious help or, or the, you know the situation is going to blow up. Uh, another thing, you want to know for sure that a great team member cannot be driven by codependent tendencies. You know, there's, there's, Codependence, there's independence, and there's interdependence. We want to be interdependent on someone. If you are with someone because you need them, then you will, you will turn into, on a, a, either on an aggressive level or a passive level, you will turn into a life-sucking vampire. I don't want anybody with me because they need me. You know, when you're sick, you need your doctor. It doesn't mean you like him. It doesn't mean you ever visit him. It doesn't even mean you're going to pay your, your, your medical bill. It just means you need him because you want him to fix something that's wrong with you. And codependency always looks to the outside and says, it's your job to make me happy. It's your job to make me scared. No, that other person, if they do those things, should do them because they want to. But it's your job to be happy. It's your job to be, to feel secure and for you to take the steps that you have to. And so, <clears throat> so a team member that's driven by need will subconsciously get into selfishness. They will subconsciously get into manipulation and really they can never truly bring love to the situation because it's the only value they have for you is what you can do for them. So you got to decide. Where are you on the codependent scale? Then a great team member will never use force to get what they want. They'll use communication. They'll use inspiration. They will use honest, objective, and subjective communication, but they will never use force. You know, when Brenda and I first got married, <clears throat> I didn't have enough money to buy her an engagement ring, so, but I bought a really nice wedding band. And so when I finally started making a little bit of decent money, I wanted to get her an engagement ring. And so we, we had an anniversary or something coming up and 
man, I go down to the jewelry store and I'm looking at everything I wanted uh, or that I knew she would like. It was just way out of my price range. So, you know, I, I, I found the section where the rings would fit into my price range. So I took her down there. We were out one night uh, on a Friday night on our kind of date night. And so, so I took her to the jewelry store. I said, let's just go here and look around. So we were in there and look around. And, and I said, you, you see anything that you'd like in here for an engagement ring? So she looked around and she said, oh man, I really, I really like that. And I said, well, let me, I said, well, well, let me ask you, do you see anything over in this area? And I took her over to the, to the cheap area. Do you see anything over, over in this area that you like? And you know, she looked and looked, she was open for it. She said, well, you know, not really. I, really, the one that really catches my eye is this one right here. And so I said, look, the truth is I brought you down here because I want to get you an engagement ring. And uh, I really, we, we can't afford this one. I can afford something over here, but I really can't afford anything over here. And, uh, you know, she was appreciative. She said, well, you know, I appreciate that. But she said, you know, Jim, I don't really care for anything over there. I'd just rather not have any, you know, anything than to have something that I just didn't like. And, uh, man, I'm telling you, now I know some people, some other, some people think, well, she should have taken that and had a good attitude. Well, that's kind of how I felt. So, you know, inwardly, man, I was offended and, uh, Oh, aggravated and felt like she was being selfish. And, 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 you know, I started to go to the force, guilt, manipulation kind of thing. But, but inwardly, I just prayed. I said, look, God, is, what can I do? What, what can I do? I really want to do this for her. And suddenly I got this great idea. And I said, well, you know what? I can't afford to buy that one by our anniversary. I can buy one of these over here. So I said, here, so here's what I will do. If there's something over here you want, we'll get it. You'll have it for your anniversary. If not, I will take what I was going to buy one of these with, and if they have a layaway program, I'll put this on layaway. Oh, actually, but let me back up one. Before we got to that stage, and I was trying to hustle her into getting the cheap one that I wanted her to get, she turned at me and she said, turned and looked at me and she said, if you're doing this for you, you can get me something out of this group over here. If you're doing this for me, then and you ask me what I like, this is what I like. And actually, that's where I got all internally jacked up. But anyhow, so I said, so I asked the guy, I said, so you guys do a layaway? And I said, what would you rather have? You, by our anniversary, have something I can buy now, or would you rather put this on a layaway and I can't make you any promises when I'm going to get it out? She said, I'd rather put it on a layaway. And I, and I did. You know what? And I started realizing, uh, uh, you know, that there's always options that do not involve force. There's always options that involve inspiration. And I can do something uh, uh, that, that inspires her that, that, and, and she'll do something that inspires me and we end up finding a positive way to, to work out a really negative solution. Also, a great team member is somebody who can disagree without fighting. And you should be able to do that. And when you ever get to the point where you're, where you're fighting, you are not fighting to win. You're fighting to get to a good solution. So you got to be able to disagree without fighting. And then last of all, you do not pass judgments. You never assume to know why anybody's saying what they're saying, doing what they're doing. You think you know, but you, you do not have the right to judge why anybody does anything. But you can ask them questions. You can just say, you know, when you just said that to me, boy, that made me, that made me feel like you meant this. Is that what you meant? You can ask people these questions and you need to let people ask you those kinds of questions and sometimes it'll help you solve a problem right on the spot. So, all right. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you what I call the top five list. And, uh, you know, there was a lot we didn't get to cover in this, but don't worry. It, it's cover, uh, anything I didn't get to cover here is covered in the book. But uh, the top five list is one of the most important exercises a couple should do, and they should do it every few years. And the top five list works like this. You take a piece of paper, you take a piece of paper, and you write down, these are the top five things that you could do to make me feel loved. Now, in these things, you can't ask anybody to do anything that's going to violate their dignity and worth. You can't make them do anything that they don't want to do. And so, you know, this is not your chance. So, oh, oh, I can finally get him or her to do something that, that uh, is illegal or dishonest or immoral or unethical or whatever. <clears throat> so you write down, here are the top things that if you would do these things, these things would make me feel loved. See, that's the thing I came to realize when Brenda asked me that question. Are you doing this for you or are you doing this for me? Well, if I want to 
make people feel loved. You know, everybody's heard the, the, the biblical saying, love your neighbor as yourself. And so we take that to say, well, this is what I like, so this is what you should like. Well, no. You know something? I grew up, man, I was, you know, I, I was a, a redneck most, most of my early life, and then I was a hippie. And, uh, you know, I didn't care anything about jewelry. I never cared about nice clothes. I never cared whether I had money or not. Uh, you know, for us, jewelry was uh, uh, get a rock and paint it and tie it on the string and wear it, you know. Uh, but Brenda liked diamonds. I didn't, think, I didn't think there was any practical use for diamonds in the whole world. But the, the question is, you know, am I doing it for her or doing it for me? And uh, if I want to make her feel loved, I've got to find out how she wants me to talk to her. I've got to find out what kind of presents she likes to get. And, and I found that most of the presents that Brenda likes I think are stupid. But that's not the point. I'm not buying them for me. Most people buy presents for their spouse. They actually pick them out based on this is what makes sense to me. This is what I like because what he or she likes is stupid. I had a guy on staff that every single year, his birthday, Christmas, every year, he would come to me and say, man, when you get a chance, talk to my wife. This is what I really want for Christmas. This is what I really want for my birthday. I would talk to her. She said, okay, I'm going to get it. I'm going to never and the five or six years, that he, eight years he worked for, with me, did she ever get him what he wanted? She always got him something she wanted him to have. And he was a good man. He always acted excited. He was always as appreciative as he could be, but he never enjoyed his presence. Are you doing it for her or for you? So you make this topless, and then you've got to make an agreement. We're not going to fuss. But what you are going to do is after you make this top five list, and you might want a, a, a facilitator, a third person there, and then when you swap these lists, talk, talk about them. And put together a strategy for how you can do the top five things that will make your spouse feel loved. And I'm not saying you have to do them every minute of every day, but I'm telling you, but, but when it's a choice of what you're going to do for them, when you want to do something for them, how are you going to do it, how and what they want you to do so that they will start recognizing you value me enough to express love to me in a way that makes sense for me. But then, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm almost two minutes over, but let me just say this. Then, after you do that for about a month, you want to do another top five list that says, these are the five things that when you do them, I feel very unloved or rejected or, or devalued. And you swap that list with a, with a facilitator or counselor there and you talk it through and then you create signals so that when that other person starts to go there, you can kind of give them a signal and you won't discuss it. You'll just walk away till you get calmed down and come back together. You know, Staying in love is real simple. Do the things that makes the person feel loved. Quit doing the things that makes them feel unloved. Uh, go home and do this exercise. And s before you do this, sit down with the traits of a good team member and share how you think you scored on each one of those points and see what your spouse says and see if there's a big difference there and make adjustments. Then share how you evaluated your spouse See if, if they evaluated themselves or something. Talk it through. Always talk things through to get to a good solution. All right, I went three minutes, five seconds over. Sorry for that. All right, guys, I'll be talking to you in one more session.